Knowing that the tomb is empty, knowing that there's nothing there, no one is in that grave. Let's go back and look at some of the more interesting things about this whole thing that leads up to the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and our victory. One of the interesting things that comes up is this thought that maybe Jesus did not want to go to the cross, that Jesus was afraid to go to the cross. Jesus might have been scared. He was looking for a different route, praying, hopefully, that something different can happen. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Well, as we go to look at this passage about him praying in the garden, before we do, let's go look and see what Jesus says in Matthew 26, 31. He's speaking to the disciples. He says, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, obviously, they don't think that's going to happen. They're not aware. They're not paying attention. But he says, I'll be struck and you will scatter. They're not really sure, but they're going to find out shortly. And verse 32 says, but after I have been, been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I said to you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing. Well, that's wishful thinking. I'm glad that they felt that way, but obviously we know the rest of the story. And as we go to it, Jesus goes to the garden and then he begins to pray. And then let's go to verse 39. He says, he goes a little further ahead of them, falls on his face and he prays saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So is he asking for, looking for a way out? Father, if it's possible, please take this cup from me. No, he's not asking for a way out. As a matter of fact, we are told in Hebrews 12, he said, look at this, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, look what he says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He came knowing exactly what he was coming to do, his purpose. Remember, it's not as though he was picked. It's not as though that Jesus was drafted into this. He voluntarily came. God in flesh emptied himself to some degree, maybe of his glory. We're not fully sure of what, obviously not of him being God. He never stopped being God and he did. So he came in humble fashion. Why? To pay a price that could only be paid by him for us. He knew what he came for. As a matter of fact, he was preparing his disciples for that very reason for why he came. He knew why he came. He was glad to come and do it. This was something that was in a divine counsel of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to determine this is what he was going to do all the way back in Genesis 3, 15. This is what was told of what was going to be happening. And we see it obviously through progressive revelation. We see more and more of this being told. And so Jesus is not surprised what's going to happen. Obviously, it's not a joyful experience in terms of how it's going to feel and in terms of what it's going to accomplish jesus came for that very reason what we have is we have what's called a conditional statement we do this sometimes we may not know what it's called but we may ask a question with the answer already in mind in order in other words it's more rhetorical than anything else remember there's no one there to hear this we don't no one no one is reporting this because they heard it but through the power of the holy spirit through the writings that we have we know what was said. Why? For our benefit. So he says, if this cup can pass, let this cup pass. Yet not as my will, but as your will be done. Now, as he makes this, he does this three times. And there's a reason why he this happens uh, three times going to them and they don't and they're asleep each time. But the point of us knowing this, it's rhetorical for us to think, can this cup pass away? Is it possible? Absolutely. Now, as a matter of fact, a similar situation takes place on the cross. This is where Jesus is on the cross and he is obviously being crucified and he, and he screams out and yells out, 
Uh, Eli, Eli, love us back to me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the, again, it's rhetorical. He's not waiting for an answer, so he didn't know. He's not in despair, not knowing what's happening. His point is that we would get it. Why is he being forsaken? Why can this cup not pass? Why can he not go through this? Well, because if he doesn't, then we're not raised. If he doesn't, then we're not saved. There's nothing for us if he doesn't. Now, remember, this prayer here is, is after another prayer, another famous prayer that he makes in John 17. Jesus goes and he prays and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you give, have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Look what he says, verse five. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I have had before you. In other words, he is actually making it clear before for the readers who he is. This is a God who does not share his glory with anyone. And Jesus is saying, give me back the glory that I had with you before the world was. And so we can honestly see here Jesus declaring before us who he is, his divinity. But then he says, I have manifested my, myself, or my, I'm sorry, your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. So what he's doing is without reading the whole point of this, uh, he is, he's praying for them. He's recognizing them, even though in just a short while, they are not even going to be able to stay awake and pray while he's praying. They kept falling asleep three times, I might add. And so then he is betrayed. Going back to Matthew 26, 45, it says, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let, it, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. When we get to this whole passage, the different passages of Peter denying Jesus, think about that. Verbally and publicly denying Jesus and Jesus is in the court and they see each other. He, it's not as though Jesus is someplace where he doesn't know. It's not that they are in separate places. They're in the same court and Peter denies him. And then what, is, what happens? Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man and immediately a rooster crows. Now, this issue of him cursing is not him saying that uh, using any sort of profanity. Him cursing is him saying, it's almost like, I swear to God, uh, cross my needle, hope to die. I promise you, uh, whatever I can curse. In other words, bringing curse upon himself if he's wrong, if he's lying. Think about it. Asking for or stating, declaring a curse upon himself if he's wrong. And he knows he's lying but he's afraid of them. The very same one that Jesus says, you are going to deny me, not me. I'm not going to deny you, but he does. And what does the Bible say? And Peter remembered the words which Jesus had said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and whipped, wept bitterly. Obviously he's fallen, but there's some solace of this. Something that we don't talk about is what Jesus said to Peter prior to him saying, you're going to deny me and Peter actually deny him. He says in Luke 22, 31, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And you would have thought that, especially me, Lord, I've been with you for these three and a half years. If Satan has designs on me uh, and you're going to pray and you're going to stop this, I hope, why don't you do that? But no, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. Wait a minute. You're not going to stop it. I have prayed for you, verse 32, that your faith may not fail. Interesting. He, Jesus prays that his faith may not fail. Looks to me like Peter's faith did fail, but Jesus says, I've prayed that your faith does not fail. So question, was Jesus's prayer not answered? Jesus is praying. Now, this is Jesus. This is not you or I, where sometimes our, our prayers are kind of hit or miss, but this is Jesus. I have prayed that your faith does not fail. So did Peter's faith fail? No, it did not. Even though it looked like that. We've got Peter going a couple of days, distraught, weeping, and away from Jesus. Uh, but there's something that Jesus says in this. He says, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. 
And look what he says. And when once you have returned, strengthen your brothers, even though Peter goes on and be and is braggadocious and uh, I'll I'll die with you. I'll go to prison with you. Yeah, right, Peter, you're going to weep. You're going to a little girl is going to run you off. But he says, and when you return, I've prayed that your strength does not fail. And when you return, what did Jesus say? Jesus is telling him that not only will you be scattered and run away, so too will the other disciples. But when you return, strengthen your brothers and they all will come back. Remember, now think about this. Our faith does not mean that we are going to be 100 percent all the time. It does not mean that we'll never have any worries, doubts or concerns. That's not what that means. Go to the Faith Hall of Fame, so to speak, in Hebrews 11, and you'll see the people there are people who have demonstrated time after time that they didn't trust God as much as we would think that they should. Think about Abram. Think about Gideon. Think about anyone that you can think of. Think about Barak. This is the one who was afraid to go and fight Sisera, but then Deborah has to step in, and then this other woman is the one that actually kills Sisera with the tent peg in his head. And the Bible says that he has faith. Again, our faith is not supposed is not going to be 100 percent God knows that. And so in this point, God tells Peter, Peter's told, when you return, your he prays your faith will not fail. And so though it might look like it, the the actual conclusion, the actual proof is in the fact that Peter does what? Peter does return. Again, we're told in Hebrews, he says, and for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. Uh, he knew what was going to happen. None of these things are oblivious to him. It's not as though that he entered into that uh, unknowingly. But I want to go to something and I think it's important, one, for us, but also the nation of Israel. At some point in time, they're going to say this. Isaiah 53. Let's go and let's let's find some points that Jesus knows is going to happen to him. It says that he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Speaking of obviously Israel, they'll look back and say this, which is why we have these past tense verbs used here. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising or chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. Praise God for that. None of this was good enough for them, but guess what? None of this was good enough for God. This would not alone satisfy God's wrath that's demanded on our behalf. That would not be enough. Blood sacrifice, his death is what's required. <laughs> and I think this clip vividly pictures him going to the cross, no matter what, carrying the cross, going to the cross, clutching the cross. But he says, no greater love has no man than he laid down his life for a friend. One of my favorite stories is after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, we see Mary show up. She sees two angels there at the tomb and listen to the dialogue that takes place, the conversation. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they are. Can you just imagine the, the, the emotion that she's filled with? I do not know where they have laid them. And she said this, she, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Can you imagine that? Just the person that you're looking for, he's right there and you don't recognize. How often does that happen? Matter of fact, there's a lot of spiritual stories that we can say behind that. But continue. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. 
this is the part that really gets me because I'm just sitting there just imagine this. She's having a conversation with the one whom she's searching for, the one who she needs, the one she's looking for, and doesn't recognize who he is until he says something. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned in. Think about it. He calls her name, seeing him, not even recognizing him, but when she hears him call her name. When we hear him call us, think about that for a second. When she hears him say, Mary, she turned and said to him uh, in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She said, stop cleaning. She was so uh, overjoyed. She goes to grabbing him and so forth. So think about this for a second. It's not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what he does. And so we think about what's happened. We think about what's going on. When we think about what he has done for us, when we think about the grave, there's nothing that he won't do to save us. There's nothing that's in the grave. There's nothing for us to worry. There's nothing that can keep us from him.